Good evening, everyone. Welcome to UX and Data. So tonight you're going to hear from James Burke. James Burke is a UX designer who has worked for agencies including Frog and Fjord, and he's been associated with communities within civic technology, urban computation, quantitated, quantified self, and the collaborative economy. He has co-founded multiple ventures, including P2P Foundation, QS Europe, Open State, and Verb Foundation, as well as worked on open source software initiatives, including Roomware. So please welcome James. Hello, thank you so much for having me tonight. And hopefully, um, I won't bore you to death. Um, so the title is really, I was just trying to think of, I was asked to come here and present on personal work and I was thinking which is, wh how are all the things that I've done in my life kind of connected. But uh, I'll just to give you a little background on um, where I'm from. Originally I studied archaeology in university. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so this is uh, some, uh, one of my first excavations and then following my very brief archaeological career I joined Burger King <laughs> very briefly as um, like careers can, can div diverge. Um, I actually did really enjoy culinary um, discovering the craft of cooking and I ended up cooking for eight years. Uh, I started a chocolate brownie business um, and at some point ended up in a weird restaurant where it was kind of performative art and food combined. So one day someone said, we have 15,000 books, do you want them? So we said, okay. And so books were used in, across the, the restaurant and this is a salad um, served on top of a book. And so as I um, continued, there was this moment where I realized I had a kind of very naive political awakening because I hadn't voted and I hadn't really thought about what's my political position on anything. And at that time, um, I was looking at my tax forms um, and wondering what actually happens when I pay my taxes, where does my money go and how does that work? And uh, of course there's Benjamin Franklin um, with a very famous quote. So I, I started this, this kind of, I, I was learning design at that time and this is just using Photoshop. I took my tax form and recreated it and decided to elect a certain amount of my, the money where I could decide where that money would be spent. So it was more like kind of collaborative budgeting. You might have heard of a project in Brazil where the town was able to, a, a slice of the, the city budget was given to the population to then decide where the money was spent and it was very successful and then it went for a few iterations and then politics ended up destroying it, um, unfortunately. So in this, uh, this is the tax overview page where I'm giving some money to education, law enforcement and in the environment. And then this is the report that the government uh, sends back to me. And as you can see, I've paid some money on the current account deficit. Um, I've also paid for some money to the AWACS shock and awe campaign in Iraq. And uh, so yeah, th you just wonder that we have some huge, this government is this vast system. How do you slice and dice that up? How do you see that small footprint of yourself inside? Um, and, and that's in a way um, maybe possible through how, through data or through through transparency, through government changing over time. Anyway, this was a very naive project in a way and this led me to um, being more curious and asking how can I get involved, how can I, um, how, how, do we have any data in the government, is it, is it available? 
we pay the government, our government's taxes, so why don't we have access to the data that they have? So we, uh, I organized an event, in, and this is in the Netherlands. I was, I've been living in Amsterdam. I'm originally British. And uh, this event, we invited civil servants, um, programmers, software designers, um, strategists, a whole bunch of people, anyone who's interested in government. And at the time, um, this was like the first of event. This led to the Ministry of Interior Affairs um, giving me some money and saying, okay, we really like what you're doing. Um, let's, well, here's some money, do something cool with it. So I was like, okay, well, people don't understand anything about data in government. So first, this, this was a design for a poster that civil servants in Holland could print out on a kind of US letter or the equivalent in Europe, A4, that they could, it's kind of like a flow chart to help them make data available that they could kind of send through their offices. So it's, it was a communication piece, as it were. And at the same time, they asked us to prototype some services where you took government data and you could make it useful because everyone was terrified. So this was, um, we got access to particulate data so it's invisible, but it's killing you. Um, I guess um, there's a bunch of sensors around the country, so we hooked that up with uh, Twitter and had the, were just experimenting. It, APIs were just arriving. They hadn't really become widespread at that time. So it was just demonstrating if you glue some different data sets together, this is what's possible. And I, I, can, I can assume now that in many countries, there's warnings sent all over social media from all sorts of sensors um, that do pretty much this. But I think in the Netherlands, this is now a, a normal service, but at the time it wasn't. And um, so that, that continued and I set up a, a nonprofit and uh, out of, we kept on doing these events, the hackathons for civil servants. One of the results of that was this service, which got a lot of media attention, which is, it has the deleted tweets of politicians. And so, of course, it's just like a meme generator or a scoop generator, it just people kept on giving because you just recorded all the deleted tweets. Um, and we had it set up in the United States and, and across the world. Um, so, yeah, we were, learning about data and discovering government data was very broken at times when we actually had the raw material of it and we had to fix it or ask for it to be fixed. But what happened was over time, government, a lot of the early adopters and cool people in the government realized actually the whole world is turning towards data. And so they, they're saying, well, we need to build a repository for all government data. And we have sites like this, which is the US um, government data, um, I guess, home. And so I think countries around the world now have this. It's even seen as a strategic resource. So much money, of course, is dependent on government data. For instance, the weather data and how that affects crop growth or not. Um, here are so this is just in the US, but we have college scorecard, crimes, housing affordability, consumer complaint, um, fruit and veg. I, I mean, these, these are all pretty random, but obviously they have a huge impact because otherwise they wouldn't be used. So, so that's just a few of the data sets that people are looking at and using a lot. Let's switch context and talk about personal and private data. So I was kind of, data was taking over the world and I started seeing people using lots of weird gadgets to record themselves, fitness gadgets, um, health. And we all know that people, of, through history, people have been writing diaries or they've been measuring themselves. There's train spotters 
or people are looking at planes in the sky and like, oh, you know, that's the Boeing 727 wingspan, you know, like really kind of nerdy. Um, there was a group of people in California who were sitting on a couch and they coined this term and said, let's do a meetup, much like this group here. And the meetup was to talk about people. We just invited people um, to talk about what they'd measured about themselves. And we held one in Amsterdam, 80 people showed up on the first time, it was crazy. People came, talked about measuring the weather, measuring how much yak milk they've been drinking, um, just all about, just the weirdest, the weirdest things you could, if, if, you know, how long they've grown their fingernail. People can measure everything, like they have the weirdest things. This gentleman was trying to see how measuring like how much coffee at what time of the day and taking cognitive tests to see when was the right time to you know drink less coffee and then of course there's a lot of companies doing you know a million product companies you measure your your genomics and you can um you can me measure your microbiome and see what kind of uh which is super important. I mean, amazing technologies. There's all sorts of sense, like networks, small pieces of technology that can send information. And um, this wireless tracker is incredible. So you can, it, it, it was picking up data that you could see areas of cities like, uh, like heat maps of where there was probably pollution independently like the data from these devices kind of indicated that because people are having asthma attacks in certain places in the city. Activity trackers. You're, you're talking about activity trackers then there's the whole thing where Google's buying Fitbit. Well that's we can talk about that later with me you know privacy and of course it seems like m there's this kind of late stage market stage where they're, they're all being bought up by the big five or six companies. So you're right. It's a dog tracker, a posture correcting tracker, which is really quite, quite fun. Um, let's see. Yeah. From this to just something really simple. So I, I, was, I wanted to do different stuff. I was like, where can this go wrong? So I was, I was like, can I measure my relationship with my girlfriend? Like, is that wrong? Is that bad? I just started going out with someone. I was dating someone a while back. And yeah, it can go wrong. Um, but so basically there's many stages in a relationship and I was past the romance phase, entering the disillusionment stage. <laughs> and so it's about building trust with the other person. And so we agreed on what we would do is we would, we set up this system where my name is James on the, so I'm the J on the, on the left, on the right. And she's, her name is Dominique and she's on the left. We're not dating anymore, just FYI. <laughs> Um, so we gave each other points, arbitrary points based on actions that had happened and there was no winning score. So in the first line it says Euro shopper wine gums. I bought a bag of these sweets. She was like, no, those are bad. No. Um, she, we were in, living in Amsterdam. So she's drunk and I'm drunk and we're on a bicycle and she's trying to kiss me while we're riding. And I'm, that's, she's giving a plus 15 to that. I'm on minus 15, like, no, I don't want to crash and die while we're kissing. And kicking a can in the street. She used to love like really riding a bike and kicking this, you know, can of Coke on the street drove me crazy. <laughs> minus 25. This is the, a stereotype which probably is completely wrong, but holding the remote control on the sofa, I gave myself, of course, plus 20. She's <laughs> minus 20. And changing channels, minus 20. And then the last one is 
I can't even see what it is. Oh yeah, carrying my suitcase. I was carrying her suitcase, so she gave me a plus five. So essentially, it was an exercise in building trust. And we did it for th a month or two months, I think. And then we never used it again. So I think in this case, it was no one had the data, except now it's on the internet <laughs> through the re recording of this, this talk. But it was a personal exchange of, of quantification between each other that was a sort of trust building exercise. That was the result for me personally. And so it wasn't like some big brother surveillance module, you know, uh, recording of our relationship. It was a very, it was like kind of a positive uh, process. Um, so there's various people that have been writing about influencing behavior of one of which I don't, I don't know why I put this slide in here, but it, it, it's a very famous, um, he writes about persuasion. Um, so I wanted to, fo I was interested in also the things that can go wrong. Um, some white hat hackers reported at a Las Vegas, um, conference that they could hack into the pacemaker heart, you know, your heart keeping you alive uh, from a distance, which was then used in uh, American TV series famously as a way of killing uh, one of the, the, main, the main characters. What happens when user data escapes onto the network? Fitbit data escaped onto the network and they could determine when people were having sex. And then we have this classic case, which for those of you, many of you know this case, but some of you don't. But Target, um, a young woman who was pregnant, um, her mother found out that she was pregnant and she didn't want her mother to find out. And the weird thing was that Target had been researching women who had baby showers, I believe it was. The buying patterns of women that have already had a, a baby shower is this event where you, you've had a child or, and then you're going to celebrate its, its birth. Like lotions and other things like that that usually pregnant people are Exactly. And they compared the buying patterns of these women that had said they're doing baby showers with normal consumers and there was an, they noticed this new buying pattern which when they then scanned other people's buying patterns which is why this automated um, we're happy that you've got a, a baby letter came through the mail and the mother picked it up without having known her daughter was pregnant. Mother was more or less fine actually. I, I she was okay in the end. Father was not. Ah. Yeah, and he called up the manager of the yes. store and yelled at them in the night. Yes. Yeah. But it's really one of those kind of you know, <coughs> first examples of algorithms at work. Um, this was another part of the you know, quantified self of weird. You know, people were wearing these things for a while, and I guess the Google Glass, you know, I don't know if that's gone away now. Yeah, here we go, classic. Um, I'm just, I'm just looking at these slides and I'm pushing through them because I'm going to, we're going to see the same slides soon. I'm going to talk about another project I did, which is, um, to do with, do you remember the Arab Spring? Does anyone know, anyone not know about that? Um, there was this moment where they turned off the internet in Egypt. And I think actually Vodafone was supplying the internet there, but they turned it off and it was like, how can they turn off the internet? And um, so that was the first time kind of there was this actual denial of service in, in a, such an extreme way. And lots of activists were using fax machines and rerouting internet around and loads of analog devices to try and get it back. 
And I think the vice president said he'd like to have that same switch that Egypt does. Uh, <laughs> there was also this, at the time, people were saying the internet is a human right, and Vince Cerf has since said, no, it's not, but, you know, it's, it's very important. And so me and a group of friends said, we'd like to know when these events happen, and can we do that? So I created this project called Choke Point, which was aiming to measure network data to notice when governments turn off the internet. And it was crazy. I had to, I got some, I won a prize, and which gave me some money to do the, the, the project. And I had to recruit. It was like more of an organizational challenge, although there's a UX side of it, but I, this is us at the, one of, there's this chaos communications camp. It's like a, old, the oldest hacker group in Germany. They organize a festival. And this is us in an East German airbase presenting our project to try and recruit people. Um, <laughs> and we managed to recruit some very amazing, oh my God, I put an animation on this thing. Uh, this is a static uh, map of censorship in 2010. <laughs> um, so with this project, we, um, we were trying to think what kind of use cases would this information be useful for. So for journalists, to, if the network goes down, have they lost contact with uh, local people? If you can detect when networks go down, um, you can also help people who've lost family members in, in disasters. And of course, there's natural disasters. So if, cell, if like tele, telephone towers go down, then it might have happened for because an earthquake took place. Um, governments are trying to it can help it can help governments with seeing what's going on, on throughout their networks uh, researchers can use it there's so many there's many many cases power outages um, lots of um, blackouts many types of um, stopping signals coming through bandwidth throttling, port and protocol blocking. I'm not as technical as the developers that were telling me that all this was possible, but this is all possible by, if on the technology like down the stack, you can detect all of these different um, things through getting the network data and then uh, going backwards and, and determining what happened. So based on all these different um, attacks, uh, potential blockages and, and, and uh, restrictions, blackouts, and attacks, I designed a basic UI, UX, uh, for, for such a service. And essentially, it's like a, having a list of all the countries in the world and having information about each of the restrictions as they happen. So you can see all of those different kinds of restrictions in different kinds of iconography here. And then there's kind of like a central, there was going to be a central site with the current attacks. And then zooming into a country, you can kind of drill down into, you know, human rights, legislation, current uh, issues happening uh, as they happen. So this was just me just doing the UX UI work. And um, the reality is that it ended up in being something like this when the developers spent 90% of the time um, building the, just making it work. Because we had, I think, 7,000 euro at the time, which then was funded to the level of, I think, 250,000 euro. And these are some other screens that um, are part of the project. 
I left the project because I couldn't add anything else. I kind of fired myself. It was becoming very technical and there was no point for me to be in, involved with it. And so I just recruited the people and fired myself. It's, I know it sounds weird, but sometimes it's good to remove yourself from a project when you don't have anything more to contribute. James, and how do you go how you define it? Um, very good question. I think this is this was a big, um, like a huge Google database of network data, and also some data from various different countries. I know there's uh, one project focused on China. There's certain regions, people with lots of different uh, network data. I think that. With all those different attacks, you, I think some are easier to read than others. So um, that's why the, the kind of results that I see here are a lot simpler than like that kind of vision of all the different use cases. Um, I spoke to the person that I gave the project over to in Amsterdam and he discontinued the project because he didn't have the funding and he pointed to two other projects that are continuing to do this kind of work. Um, it just costs, takes a lot of time and people aren't so interested in the actual <laughs> results. Um, it's just not going to get that much. It, it, it doesn't have a daily use and it's mainly for researchers and I guess the military is probably interested in, in having this but they probably have their own capability in their cyber teams. So there's net blocks. This is like currently running uh, projects that do this kind of work. And this is like a, the other day they just detected Iran turned off the internet. And there's, there was this project called Uni that also does similar work. So on to um, privacy and design. Uh, the Pew Institute the other day released this crazy report talking about how Americans are kind of, they don't trust, uh, they think the government and companies have all their data. They are, they feel kind of scared and, and, and out of control and, and they're not happy about it, but they feel powerless, basically. They feel powerless and they don't understand it. Um, I'm not a law lawyer and I'm just going to point you to other sources and maybe there's people with better legal backgrounds in regarding information law inf and, and privacy but there's certain inf there's laws that go back to before the 20th century that predate this um, and the current um, Basically, at the moment, we're in a situation where the, the, the law for protection of privacy, uh, it, it is updating and it is getting stronger, but it, it's like this constant battle backwards and forwards of, you know, there's new developments in technology which challenge our, our, our laws. Um, next year in California, this law will go on the 1st of January into effect, and so it's very much inspired by the European GDPR ruling where I don't know if this California law has the right to be forgotten but certainly the companies can't sell your data onto another company. You have the right to know um, the, all the data being collected by a business about you. I think you can make two requests a year to a company. Um, there's a lot of, I mean you, you can go to this website, I think it's CAP caprivacy.org backslash about but it's to like if you are a, a designer a UX designer one of the most important things is what is legal <laughs> if you're designing software know what's legal um, people might ask you some companies say like we just want all their data but maybe that's actually maybe there's regulation around the use of the data what you can ask for that's that's not legal um, this is the European Union uh, site, which, which has information about data privacy in Europe. And in New York, 
it's in Congress at the moment. The Shield Act's coming as well next year. So what do we do on our websites? We, we have cookies that enable a lot of useful things, and at the same time, they can be destructive because they, they, they stash stuff in, they make services work. Um, how do UX designers um, present privacy choices without overwhelming the user? So obviously, it's useful to make it simple and at the same and understandable, and not you know we're often faced with these like four pages of terms and conditions. It's really hard. People just want to get to the main course. They're not interested in dealing with. They, they've done polls on this. People just click yes and they they want to get to to the service and they give away their privacy. The European Union um, recommends a whole bunch of different uh, kind of uh, their advice on design for for talking about privacy, just having this um, drilling down into more information, building dashboards to show how your data is um, being like what are, what are the different um, states that you've uh, fixed to your data. Having um, information when you're filling in forms that it's giving you contextual information on um, the, the field itself. And this is like, this is this checkbox here. I'm filling in a form on a website for a job and it's telling me how it's going to use the data, and um, which is which is really good. Like that, you can be more informative of the use of the data itself rather than just asking for information. Uh, this is a, a startup, and they are giving their their kind of promise. This is what we can, what we'll do. This is how we're going to abuse your data or not abuse your data. So it's actually pretty interesting because it's like when we, if we get bought, we can't do anything about it. Your data is the next company, so you're, you're screwed or not. I mean, your data could be protected, but they are at least open about that, which I appreciate. So when you're, one question to ask when you are designing as a UX designer is how much data do you collect or how much do you need to collect to do the task you need to do? So that's something to definitely, why do you need to more form fields and when you, you literally just need two or one? So that's a good question to ask yourself. Um, Addiction by Design is more, this is a fantastically interesting book by, um, on how it's very creepy but it's like how design is used to keep people um, gambling um, it's Mike Montiero he uh, also wrote a book called Room by Design and I thought he was interesting in that he he was really calling the design community out in saying a lot of um, the privacy leaks or a lot, a lot, he basically said every company has to take full responsibility for all the problems that happen with when, when things go wrong. And I don't always, I don't totally agree with him, but I, I love that he wants to take responsibility. And I think that it's, our, it's in our best interest to, to, to think the same way and to feel that deep care for making sure that we release products that that don't damage uh, people and don't treat like a data point as just remember there's a person behind it. He, he might have not heard of the work of Paul Virilio who <laughs> kind of says that when, you, yeah, basically when you invent a technology, you're going to invent its kind of some, the unforeseen uh, circumstance that goes along with inventing it. There's also companies now that are trying to p 
push a lot of the algorithmic, like instead of storing data on a, a remote server, they're trying to do a lot of the processing in a new, an, an, using new anonymity uh, called differential privacy on the device itself. Um, I'm not an expert in, in privacy, but it's definitely better than storing the information in the cloud and a lot more private. So that's a new trend that is coming through. Uh, Apple are doing it as well with messaging. Um, here is a few links that I just like to leave you with. If you are interested in the civic data space, there's a competition that uh, on the 13th of December, um, you can submit an idea and you can look at these, uh, you can find the California Consumer Privacy Act and the, the, the data law things that I just pointed out. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed this talk and thank you very much. Besides the few legal and regulation things you showed, GDPR, California, et cetera, can you talk a little bit about data privacy and maybe what some companies are doing to help data privacy or those that you think maybe aren't doing a really good job with data privacy? I'm not really an expert, but I do know, I mean, Microsoft just said they're going to implement the Californian law across the country, which is good. And Google today said that they're, I guess that, that's about political advertising. No, that's nothing to do with privacy. Um, uh, I think that it, it would be nice if companies could, I mean, more and more access to ha owning our data. That's the thing I fear is like, I feel like we, we, we do this bargain with the devil as it were, like you get all this free stuff and then they, resell your data. So I wish it was more tangible. We had some kind of interface where we could own our data and then have that as a resource to then, you know, feel empowered and in control of that. And I feel we, I don't know if we can turn back the clock. We're too, we've, we've gone too many cycles inside the system. What, what do you think? I'm curious what you think. Something on what you just said is exactly correct that somehow we got to a point where we as a consumer don't own our data. We somehow got to a point just because of people's apathy, I think, that companies own data about you and they can monetize it as much as they want. Whereas really it should be the flip side where we own our own data and we should be able to monetize what companies are doing with our data. But that, sh that ship sailed. Uh, I mean, it, uh, um, who was it? The Google Health Vault, which Google mothballed, I don't know, was it 10 years ago, something like that, um, where they were trying to make that your health record, your health data of record that you owned it, that your doctors would put your data in there, and that you'd be able to decide what happened to it. They shut it down because nobody was using it. Because like I said, it was apathy. People didn't really care all that much. Um, so it's, it's two sides of the same coin that companies are abusing what they do with our data now, but people as a whole didn't care enough back when things was, were still formative that things could have been different, but people didn't care enough back then, or they didn't know enough to care enough. I agree. And I, I feel, feel like, like maybe, maybe there, I mean, there's still hope, hope that we shouldn't give, give up hope. I mean, I think that there's a possibility of maybe some future company or organization that can come up with that new experience or, or user interface that kind of rekindles our, that we can gain back our, um, data depends on which kind of data. Different countries have different rulings. Like in Finland, health data you have access. Like they're, they're so far ahead with their e-citizenship, so you immediately are notified when anyone's messing with your uh, your government your your um, medical records. So 
that could have never happened, this thing with Google and the health company where, because the citizens would have had to be notified before the whole deal went down, although apparently in this country it was is fully legal, I believe, although people were screaming bloody murder. So I think different countries will have different laws. and, and So I, do th I, do, I, I think it's possible that um, it depends on which data, but yeah, it leads us down all sorts of weird alleyways of like where through AI um, different data sets are kind of compared and contrasted with each other that like in really negative ways potentially, although the, the health, there's of course the promise of having access to our medical records will lead to new cures, like from the genetic data to everything that we can cure all these diseases. But at the same time, there was this example I read in a book where through some AI pattern uh, algorithm makes this kind of detect something from your social media usage that it can tell your future health and so you don't get employed because it can detect your future, you're going to be less healthy in the future. And you didn't even know about that, but you're just not hired because of that weird kind of correlation. So that stuff like that is more free, you know, weird to, to me. Next question. So j just to make minor point, it was not Google Health World, it was Microsoft Health World. Google, Google has another program, it went nowhere. Microsoft Health World, I never worked for neither, but I got some like initial money from Microsoft to develop apps on Health World. Back then it was, if I understood it correctly, there was no business model behind. There were a lot of regulatory issues. That's why it went nowhere. It's not that people didn't use it, but there was no pickup kind of and scale up model. Okay. Okay. So my question is this: I kind of respectfully disagree that it's kind of you know train has already gone the state left the station. I think we can GDPR. People in Europe felt they're done too, but GDPR reversed a couple of major unfortunate trends. What do you think um, should happen on national level here? And what are the best models, like this example of Finland you gave? Other great examples of how it's done right in other countries? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's too early to tell, but definitely uh, I love, like if it's your own data and you have a government that's really, I don't know, I feel like government should be like good parents to children, you know, it's like should be taking care of you. So in that way, it could be a good service that, you know, does give you access to your data. I just looked recently at the a service from my city and often the government information services seem very simple and not like they don't have, they need to put more talent into, you know, be, get the incredible experiences that we're used to from the commercial sector. Um, I'm positive. I, I have to be. I mean, I think we can regulate and I think that we, we, we need to um, do what we can to, to, to get to a future that we want to live in because there's no point being negative about it. It's not going to help anyone. But we've seen the dystopias and yeah, like, like Elon Musk as well, he, he's quite right and, you know, he fears general computing intelligence run amok, so, but at the same time he's investing in it. So I think you have to take responsibility and dive in there and try to, like GDPR. I don't know how, I'm, I'm a new immigrant to this country, so the way that the federal and the state level interact, that's kind of this ongoing fight it seems in this country and California creates a law and then the coasts create their laws and then the federal states like wait a second we want to regulate both of you so I don't know how that works here I'm used to the Netherlands a small country in Europe um, you what do you yeah what's your take on on that how do you see how things will play out here as you live here 
That would be first step. Uh, and I hope if you learn from successes of other places, like Estonia is doing great with this kind of issues, Finland uh, and Scandinavian countries in general doing better than others. I hope there is, like, there is hope. James, thanks for presenting and, and sharing your insight and also like spurring this, this great conversation. Um, I want to comment on the data privacy problem that, that we're all bringing up and discussing. I'm working, <clears throat> I'm not a data scientist, I'm actually a lawyer, <laughs> but I work with a team of data scientists who are working on solving this exact problem. And what we believe is that we should all use data to drive decisions, but also that organizations now have a responsibility to protect our customer and user data. And one of the ways we're looking at this, or to bring up something, you brought up differential privacy, which is a step in the right direction, but it has two issues. One is that you're adding noise to data, and any time you add noise to data, it's becoming less useful. It becomes more private, which is good, but then less useful. Right. And we want to share our data um, unknowingly to build better products and better services to help us, right? So one of the ways we're solving this is uh, we've created a synthetic data engine where it's an unsupervised model, um, machine learning model that learns a data set and then trains a model and then builds another synthetic data set from scratch that cannot be reverse engineered. And healthcare companies and banks, but to use an example used before, there are large healthcare organizations who are really excited about this and using our, our technology. So that way they can solve some of the world's health issues without putting any of the individual users or customers or victims or patients at risk. Um, so my question to you, back to the UX side, and you brought this up earlier, is what type of ideas do you have from a UX perspective, and how can we collect data, but also make people feel uh, more secure in doing that? In a health context. Or in any context, in whatever each of us are working on. I mean, it, it, I feel like it's, it's, people are fickle, so they did, like, they found that if, if you offer people a very small amount of money, they would just give you their data and they would not even give a shit on the repercussions. That's, so that's kind of sad, number one, because everyone's quite informed and well-educated and maybe you'd be a lot more kind of picky in, in how you would give the data away. It's trust. I mean, it's really hard, but I don't think it's... Because to give the data is not like a crazy UX step, right? It's literally like you have to get grant permission and then people have to understand what you're doing, but they won't because <laughs> it's like synthetic databases with the next level of differential privacy. So um, I guess they have to hope that it will have something positive, a positive outcome. So that would encourage people to share. And then of course, as we, some of the examples showed, like, just be open the whole way. You know, this is what we're doing with your data all the way across throughout the steps of whatever, what you're doing with them. So there's tr total transparency. And even if it's, like, negative, like, and if we get bought, we can't guarantee what's going to happen with the data. So you know, need to know this is a risk, too. Then you can just say that, you know, this is the risk. And that's what that startup said. I mean, so it's up to you. You make your, your privacy decision. Um, but yeah, and then it's up to, I want to invest in, you know, rolling the dice and hoping this health research goes somewhere important. So yeah, that, that's my two cents. Um, I just, I had a note. Uh, first of all, that I do think that there are companies now that are starting to allow people to monetize the power of their own data. That is, perhaps it failed in the past, but it is starting to happen again now. I know of at least one uh, that is promising to do that, at least. But actually, my question was, when you had the slide up by Ma uh, Mike Montero, you said that you disagreed with him about the degree of responsibility of individual designers, I believe, in terms of... Uh, their responsibility for, um, their ethical responsibility, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And so I just wanted to say, what would you say is the responsibility, if any, of UX designers and UX writers? 
I mean, it's a tough one, but it's just more the, like the unforeseen, It's an interesting one to answer. Like, I love him in the sense that he's like, I own my shit. Like, I gave birth to the car and the car crash came. It's on my watch. That's on me, you know, but still people are going to get hit by a car or, you know, there's going to be a car crash, but at least, you know, I like, but in a way he, it's just doesn't add up though. At the same time, it's like any technology will create its anti, like, will create an accident. So I think that he could just be a little less absolutist, that's all. Um, so, yeah, it, does that answer your question? What do you, do you think? think? Yeah. I, I, will, um, I would just say that maybe in previous ages there was more of a, a feeling of personal responsibility of, and it feels like we're in an age without personal responsibility. So if you encourage the maximum, maybe you'll actually see a little bit of it. Okay. And also that um, we like to, not that Zuckerberg is innocent, but by having figureheads like Zuckerberg, we yield our responsibility as individuals all the way down the line. So um, in fact, he does make a lot of decisions, but there are decision points, I guess, for instance, if we'll level it. True, true. To be continued. It's a good, good question. Thank you so much. Um, you kind of touched on my question already, so I hope this isn't redundant. But I'm kind of curious about how we find our reservation point when we're going to be giving over our data. And to put that question into context, I don't want to use Facebook. It doesn't really matter to me. However, Google Maps is an incredibly valuable tool to me, and I use it all the time, and will continue to give my data to Google Maps every single day of my life. Uh, how, do, you know, how do we create a tool as designers or as individuals or users as to like, when do we choose to give our data? Where's that tipping point? It's a hard one. I can only talk for myself and I, I'm kind of embarrassed of, you know, I wish I'd had my own email address for a long time, but I've used I've made the deal and I've been very happy with the free services, but I've been farmed and had many advertisements served to me. Um, I guess it's hard to, you have to decide that for yourself. I know it's a, a tricky one, but um, as designers, they're just going to make services that hopefully are, you know, wonderful and give you those choices where, where it's, where where it's necessary or you know ethical in the case of it's it's legal following the new laws that are coming in um yeah i i i guess i have friends that are completely don't use only social media and they're always complaining to me i can't escape anyway um, i use a phone and i'm being tracked and they're gonna use my this against me and i'm like yeah i can't stop i can't stop it sorry and so even if you don't make choices, choices, um, I, I guess you have to basically live in the middle of the woods and, and just have wooden, you know, everything. But you, you need to build a Faraday cage. But uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. Sorry, that's a... Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on user researchers here? Um, you've spoken from the UX design point. Um, but for, UX for user researchers who maybe pull data on, and I mean, I've done it myself, um, where I pull data on individuals creating profiles to find patterns, right? Um, and um, I work in B2B, so no one's putting in like their personal like diaries into like the, the platform that I'm working on. But I can see how this can get weird if you're working in a B2C product Facebook or um, even something like Uber, like they just did so I think I heard that they announced that they're going to be tracking conversations in cars and like to the protect the drivers. Yeah, the consumer in me is like, okay, that's creepy. The product designer in me is like, I can see why someone would want that information to improve their product. So the consumer in me is kind of freaking out, but also coming from the product side, I 
might understand why they make that decision. So what are your thoughts there? I mean, you're talking about user researchers, right? UX researchers. Or yeah, like research or product design to make the product better, to learn more about your I feel story. like uh, I, it's a very gray area. In my own experience, I've never, like in my own experience, because I've worked a lot in agencies and, and design studios, they've been very sloppy. And there's either the UX research has been like not very specific and it's just been kind of after the fact, so I just have to kind of do it myself and, and initiate. Else, there's no privacy policy around, oh, we just did all these user interviews. We will delete these audio files from our devices at this time, and we will send you a completion of deletion, and we are not, they're not in cloud storage, and they will not be used by our company at a certain light. You know, there should be a kind of sell by, die by date to UX research that I, I, I think it's a really, you should go and write a Medium article on this topic. Because we don't have, I haven't seen anything about it and guidance, but I think it's really important. Um, so, uh, I was, as I was going through your talk, and again, great uh, presentation, thank you. Um, the difference, the, where the, line lies between private and public, I suppose. And in the, and as human beings, we exist and we leave footprints of all kinds, including data. And it started me thinking when I, at the beginning of your presentation, when you were showing your, you know, original start in anthropology, I mean, that, that, that's a record of some human being at some point that they've left behind. That's, that's their data, right? Um, you know, like I'm a photographer, and I love looking at old photographs, and when I go to flea markets, looking through a whole bunch of old photographs that people have thrown away, these are snapshots that you know they took, and in their lives, probably not worth a whole lot. But now, as we look back, there's a lot of very valuable data in there. So how, where do we draw the line between, this is my stuff, I'm never gonna share it, and uh, once I'm gone, it's gone. And like maybe like a copyright sort of model where it exists, it's mine for a certain amount of time, but then at a certain point, it sort of goes out into the public realm and it becomes a part of, of the greater data set where it's not gonna impact me because I'm long gone, but it could actually, you know, add to a, a larger conversation that exists long before, you know, after I'm long gone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? From the kind of more analogy period to into this weird digital where there's all these digital artifacts left on social networks that died and what's the reuse on i mean there are copyright laws about reusing photography or re uh, I, and copy and and patent idea laws so i don't know i guess there's you go to a, a thrift store and you pick up some old photographs and the unwritten rule is it's yours to do with whatever. And if the family member comes by and says, why did, I was at this gallery and I saw butt cheeks drawn over my granddad's face. I'm really angry. <laughs> yeah, then you might need to have a, a discussion with them about the rights. But usually there's an unwritten rule that, but yeah, no, I mean, if they brought a lawyer out about granddad, then you might be in trouble. I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a gray area. On, I, I assume that once it's thrown out on the street, then it's anyone's, but I'm sure there's people who have been prosecuted for that. So, yeah. Thank you very much, James, and thank you everyone for a great conversation. Um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you to our volunteer, Lisa. Uh, so we will be back here next month on December 11th, and we will have finding inspiration in historic data visualizations. Jason Forrest will talk about how studying the past of data visualization helps us gain an appreciation of techniques, forms, and ideas for new applications in our future work. He will explore a number of 20th century data visualizations and show an example of how um, of his own research. 
Uh, Jason's a UX designer and data visualization specialist at McKinsey and & Company and editor-in-chief of Nightingale, the Journal of the Data Visualization Society. So I hope to see you on December 11th. Uh, stick around, meet somebody new, and have a good evening. See you next time. <laughs>